presented by Still a Frog. She'd driven the 253 miles to her father's 70th birthday celebration. The wind and the tires humming together, the song of the American road that she'd known almost from birth. Soothing, but at the same time exciting. Four hours alone, with little to do except contemplate the bedlam that was her family dynamic. She supposed her parents and siblings weren't all that deranged, just your average, everyday, dysfunctional crew. Loud, but lovable, they were breathtakingly judgmental, modern-day Puritans who'd like to see you locked in the stocks in the town square as punishment for your wretched behavior, but who'd then make a huge to-do out of forgiving you, publicly, on The Jerry Springer Show. You'd be the one humiliated on national television, and they'd be right there, piously granting you absolution, always supportive but always gravely concerned that you not mistake their support for approval, always ready to lay on the guilt. And this 42-year-old still single woman <laughs> gave them plenty of fuel for the fire. She was convinced that her parents, her mother especially, had already painted some, a pathetic picture of what she was destined to become. A lonely, shriveled spinster, subsisting on cheap microwave dinners, with nothing but soap opera reruns and possibly a dozen cats for companionship. Ugh, she had white-knuckled the steering wheel, stealing herself for the ordeal that awaited. Two days of not-so-subtle shaming as she was repeatedly reminded of her perpetual singledom at family gatherings. She'd seen the dreaded weekend flash before her eyes over and over like the video of a car wreck that you just can't stop watching. Her rambunctious nieces and nephews running amok, her mother catering to her grandkids every obnoxious demand. It was galling how she just worshipped the little criminals, even while she somehow managed to mention her unmarried daughter's failure to attract a mate whenever she was talking, which was most of the time. Credit where credit is due, you had to hand it to Mom. She was the master. And hanging on her mother's every word would be her younger, beautiful sister, the suck-up, along with the vaguely smarmy and annoyingly self-righteous millionaire who'd been her husband for the last 17 years for crying out loud. Was there no justice in this cosmos? And lastly, straight from the shallow end of the gene pool, there was, of course, the prodigal ne'er-do-well baby brother, whom her mother thought could do no wrong. Stealing flirtatious glances and kisses from his tart of a second wife. No way that girl hadn't been a hooker. She probably still was. How, in the name of all that's holy, did her bungling buffoon of a brother snag two marriages when she couldn't even find a steady boyfriend? Where was karma when you needed it? It would probably be no-holds-barred emotional combat. But maybe not. She could always hope, which she did, for all of about one second, until reality rudely elbowed its way into her daydream with the central fact. Here she was again, showing up solo. No date at the dinner table for this girl. Oh, sure, there was Mr. Possibility. She could have roped into coming. Actually, he seemed more like Mr. Meets the Criteria, but where's the chemistry? And he'd volunteered. But if she'd brought him, it would have been just for show. Plus, she wasn't sure if he'd really meant it when he made the offer, or if he was just being polite. I mean, after all, they'd only had two dates. And strange dates at that. It had started, interestingly enough. His online profile revealed a decent man. A divorcee with full custody of two teenage sons a devout follower of all things related to college football, and, oddly enough, an avid reader of Eastern philosophy. She could have gone a lifetime without ever hearing a single word about either subject, but he somehow managed to make both things seem almost interesting. Or at least not eyes-glazed-over, slack-jawed, just-shoot-me-now boring. And despite his busy days as a financial consultant, he was also caretaker to his recently widowed father, who was suffering from Alzheimer's. Jeez, what a solid, decent human being. It's too bad we're just not more alike, she mused. But ultimately, it was his love of family that won her over. 
not exactly a Bridget Jones movie, let alone <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. In fact, it wasn't even the stuff of a grocery store romance novel. What it really felt like, more than anything else, was that she was being courted, <laughs> clumsily, by a thoroughly decent professor, who could put a class of sophomores to sleep within seconds, solidly responsible, but not the first guy who'd come to mind for a sex fantasy. Hmm. So after three marathon phone sessions covering Confucius, Crimson Tide football, family heartbreak, and all things in between, they agreed to meet at a local Italian bistro, and on a Saturday evening. Yep, the one night of the week officially reserved specifically for bona fide romantic dates. She applied just the right amount of blush, dabbed perfume on both wrists, and strategically in the cleavage, just in case, and she stepped into her new black pumps. She'd spent way too much for them. Amazing how a salary that looked substantial on paper was never enough. But the shoes were worth every penny she paid for them. The perfect mixed signal. Proper elegance and blatant seduction. Even so, things didn't feel quite right. Part of it was that she did not have the usual first-date butterflies. But there was something else. Something beneath the surface that she couldn't quite put her finger on. It wasn't dread. Not doubt. Resignation, maybe? Nah. It certainly wasn't guilt. <laughs> she could identify that with no trouble. But, oh, no, well, yeah, there it was. Self-worth. Or rather the feeling that she lacked it. And now, mysteriously, out of nowhere, a deep desire to claim it. Barely an hour later, she sat across the red and white checkered table from Mr. Possibility, ruby-colored Chianti and romantically flickering candlelight between them. The conversation was engaging and witty and even deep at moments. He was lovely and kind. She felt charming, and she knew he was taken with her. So for a few fleeting seconds, her mind darted to the granny panties as she tried to shake the little pangs of regret that she was now beginning to feel for wearing them. It had been a hasty decision, but she wasn't taking any chances. She wanted that stretched-out elastic and too-much fabric backing up her resolve, ensuring a no-touch zone that would kill any possibility of weakness on her part, allowing for a passionate what-if goodnight kiss. The kind of kiss they had recently led to a little awkward fumbling around in the dark half-naked first date fun, with the only one of her online suitors who seemed the least bit promising and had led to the even more awkward not-returning of her phone calls by the same suitor, who had by then fallen completely out of the promising category. But she was not going to need the granny panties for backup because there was no way things were going that far. She knew the reason. It was the same thing she'd felt before they met. That vague sense that she was somehow unworthy. But why? It wasn't that her apartment was in shambles or that her credit card debt was, what's the word? <laughs> oh yeah, impressive. Those things hadn't affected how she'd reacted to any man before. So why now? Could it be that Mr. Possibility was too dedicated as a father? Too devoted as a son? Was he too thoughtful? Too considerate? In a sudden flash of insight, she realized that was exactly what it was. And at first, it irked her right down to her core. How in the world did this man manage to carry himself with such obvious grace, despite a painful divorce, two difficult teenage boys plus an aging, ailing, widowed father, when she often had trouble just liking her family from far away? And she usually had difficulty just tolerating them when she visited. It was as if this handsome man was holding up a much-needed mirror for her. Not intentionally, he wasn't even cognizant of it. But without realizing it, let alone meaning to, he was reminding her of all she'd never been for her mother, for her family, for the men who'd come before him, or even for herself. And in that moment, it had hit her that she dug him. She really dug, and he dug her. But digging the guy was one thing. Having a relationship with him, something else. 
Was it even possible with a man whose whole way of life seemed to highlight her most glaring faults? If it was, then what needed to change? And what was she afraid of? Did she think that he had already outgrown her, long before they'd ever met, simply because of his quiet determination to live a certain way, come what may? Or was she simply outgrowing herself? Was she looking at his life and wanting more from her own? More joy and, and less friction with her family? And maybe even fulfillment with him? She'd been grappling with those questions since the night they'd met. They'd been on her mind for the entire drive, and she didn't feel any closer to answers when she turned onto the old, familiar suburban street. The houses weren't large, and the cars parked in front of them were neither upscale nor new. But the magnolia trees were stately, adorned with Spanish moss. The smallish yards were carefully trimmed, and neighbors were decent people who took the time to wave. And then, as she pulled into the driveway of her parents' modest three-bedroom house, her childhood home, it came to her. Yes, she was here to celebrate the past, the 70 years that her father had lived, more than 40 of them as her dad. But she was also there to begin the future. The verdict might still be out on Mr. Possibility as a mate, but he had inspired her to open a new chapter with her family. And what better place to do it than here, immersed in every wonderful memory she had of growing up. Tree houses, birthday parties, bedtime stories, and most of all, loving parents. She called him, told him she was there, thanked him for his offer to go with her. And without so much as a second thought, she said that when she came back to her mother's a few months from now, during the holidays, she wanted him to come with her. And he loved the idea. But it was only after she hung up that she said softly to herself what she really thought. I don't want him with me because he's a man. I want him with me because of the kind of man that he is. And she walked in to start afresh with the people she'd known the longest. Um.